Welcome to another edition of Journey of Hope. Thrilling stories of people going through the journey of life, encountering difficulties and obstacles. Our story today is about two people that have had incredible resilience and noticing God intervening in their lives. Our special guest today is Judith Riven and her dear friend, Ava Brutus from the Los Angeles area. We're so glad to have you here today, and we want to hear your story. I know that uh, you've got a thrilling story to tell, but let's tell the audience here where you're from, first of all. Los Angeles. From the Los Angeles area. Have you always been there? Did you go to grow up there? I grew up in Orange County. In Orange County. Went to school? At UCLA and the University of Michigan. You went to UCLA and the University of Michigan, and what did you take? Uh, social work. Take a social work. So you finished your, your schooling there. Did you do some graduate work also? Well, I got my LCS, uh, my MSW at the University of Michigan, and then I didn't go beyond the MSW. Okay. And tell us about you, Ava. Where are you from? Uh, hi. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm from the Philippines, but I've been living here for more than five years now. And okay. I live in Los Angeles as well. Uh, I used to be a banker, but in the Philippines. In the Philippines, but I am an industrial management engineer that worked in the bank and eventually became a bank manager. So you're a bank manager. I am now all over there in the Philippines. In the Philippines. Okay, and you've been over here for about five years. Yes. Okay. Well, there's a fascinating story about how the two of you got together. But tell us a little bit about the kind of work you were involved in after you got out of school. Well, I've worked in many different uh, areas of s clinical social work in the last 20 years have been in palliative care, hospice, working in nursing homes, working with people with chronic illness in various settings in various ways. So were you working in a, uh, in a, in a, in private homes or were you, Sometimes did they come I, to you or? Uh, all of the above. All of the above, Yes. Really? So did you have your own business then or are you working for somebody else? I several different components. When I went to the nursery, nursing homes, I was working on grant money. Uh, one chunk of grant money from UCLA, uh, another chunk from someplace else. When I was uh, doing hospice work, that was volunteer. Um, and then when I was going, and then when I was in pro my private practice, I had people come into my office and in addition, I did volunteer work going to visit people in their homes and in the hospital. Well, so, so how long were you involved in hospice work? Um, oh, about 15 years. Were you? That's got to be a very draining type of emotionally, I would think. Um, in, in some ways? In some ways it is, and in some ways it's, it's obviously very inspiring. Yeah. But then you got involved in helping with some drug uh, abuse situations? That was way before the palliative care. Oh, was it? The okay. palliative care is the most recent part of my um, career. Did you, did you get burned out? Well, what I got, well, I got burned out working with um, ch abused and neglected children. Oh. That really burned me out. And then I got then I got into palliative care through um, I worked under a rabbi with two colleagues who started a Jewish healing center and he said I said I'm burnt out with this other work I'm doing and he said good join us so that's how I got involved with all the palliative oh, care. Oh really? So they had yes. a was it called a healing center? Yes. And something he started up, or? It, it's something that is across the United States, and he started the one. In Jewish synagogues? Not in synagogues, in, um, in usually in Jewish family service agencies. Oh, really? OK. And, um, and this was like another chapter? This, another chapter, yeah. yes. OK, another chapter. So you worked in that for a number of years? Yes. around. I guess about 20 really? total. 
Okay. And I, we were talking about a mutual friend of ours, Bill Aaron. Yes. Is this how you got acquainted with Bill? Yes, I, I and got And for our listening audience, he's just come out with a wonderful book about 120 cancer survivors and thrilling stories of different people that have had cancer. But you knew Bill then. Well, I knew Bill because um, through the, he was also involved with the rabbi that started the healing center and he had prostate cancer and there were just many connections to Bill. Over the, over the period of time? Over, over the period of time that I was doing the work that I was doing. Uh -huh. So everything is going along fine and we need to find out how the two of you met, but uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. So everything was going fine and then what happened? And then I uh, went to a neurologist because I for a totally different problem than I ended up having, but um, he he ordered some um, tests for me. And I mean, what were you experiencing? Okay, what I was experiencing it was completely different. Totally different. I was having shooting pains down my leg, and and then he said, "Do you have pains anyplace else?" And I said, "Well, not a big deal, just some pain down the arm and in my fingers." And his eyes lit up. He said, which fingers? And I showed him my fingers. And he ordered a, uh, an MRI of my upper spine and found a growth. A growth. So you go in there because you have pains in your leg. Yes. And you begin talking to him, and he begins exploring whether you've got any other pains. And, well, not really, but, but I do have this little thing here. And, and that kind of must have alerted him to something. Yes, it, it did. And, um, and then he alerted me to something on October 27th when he, showed, when he said, you have, you have a growth on your spine. A growth? And so um, then I went to one neurosurgeon and- This is all in the Los Angeles area? All in the Los Angeles area, all within the last months. Okay. And, um, and then I got, was, went for a second opinion to somebody I didn't know. He was just recommended, and it turned out, this is the beginning of this fortuitous journey, that he was a, is a chordoma specialist. Now, had they identified it as a chordoma at this point? He apparently did use that word, but I didn't hear it in the consultation. This, this the first time around, and all kinds of yes, things are coming at you? Yes, right. And, and for our listening audience, what is a chordoma? A chordoma is an extremely rare, one in a million people. I knew you were special. Um, one in a million growths are a chordoma. And there is no cure for a chordoma. But as my surgeon told me, actually, too soon, I was so out of it with the anesthetic, but the first words out of his mouth practically are, you're going to Loma Linda. Really? Yes. And all you know is you've got a chordoma, you're coming out of surgery, and after the surgery, as you're coming out of it, he said, you're going to Loma Linda. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I knew you were supposed to be here. Yes. Well, I didn't. Now, tell me, you were by yourself at this point. Did you have some friends and family? Or yes. Are you struggling all by yourself at this point? No, no, no. I, I have my friends and my family were in the hospital visiting me and with me at home, I mean, you know, After, so afterwards. afterwards. Right. And so you have the surgery, and what are they telling you then? There's, they're saying that my, he said that my chance, my one chance for survival is to get radiation therapy, proton radiation. So you moment. know at this point it's a very serious thing. Big deal. Your one chance of survival. Yes. Not recovery, survival. Survival. Is to have proton. Yes. And he knew, or he or she knew about Loma Linda. Oh, yes. He, 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 Loma Linda, Loma Linda, Dr. Laredo, Loma Linda, that's all he pounded into me. And he's a Cordoma specialist. Mm hmm. What a, what a blessing to be able to find Dr. Right, Barkadarian is his yeah, name. To find yeah. the right doctor at the right time. Un unbelievable. And then the second thing was, when I got home, I had not prepared. I was not prepared for what I was going to come home with. Um, I had 
So to you went in the hospital thinking they're just going to remove this little thing? Little teeny thing, no big deal. No big and deal. I, it was quite extensive, the surgery. The surgery was. And. Um, How long were you in the hospital? Well, I was in the hospital for a week. Um, the, the, the first surgery was six and a half hours where he removed as much of the growth as he could that was wrapped around my spine. And the doctor who put the pins in, then they stitched me up, put me, did a CAT scan, and he said, I don't like the way the, the rods and screws are situated. This and is why you're still in surgery. No, this was after the surgery. After they the took surgery. me out after six and a half hours, then two hours CAT scan. Then they did a second surgery for three and a half hours where he replaced the rods and the screws because the... He didn't like the way they were placed. ...placed because the chordoma had eroded the vertebrae. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't secure where they placed it? Yeah, it, yeah. So th you can imagine the shape I was in. Oh, my. He had nine, ten hours of surgery. Eleven and a half Eleven to and be a exact. half to be exact, but who's counting? Unbelievable. So you go in, the hospital think you're gonna have, be in and zip out and pretty soon you're gonna be running around but you get this sobering news that it was far more extensive. So how are you feeling about this point? And, and I do have to say he probably was more sobering when I consulted with him, but I, pro I was... You were filtering it out. Yeah. Big yeah. time denial. Yeah. I saw it right in front of me. I mean, you'd have to... Anyway, filter it out. So how I was feeling, um, I had a rough time after the surgery. Physically and emotionally? Mostly physically, because of all the anesthetic and I couldn't take the pain relievers, etc. So I got home and a friend of mine had gotten somebody who was a caregiver who was working on another job who could be with me part of the time. Because you were home uh, by yourself? By myself, and she brought in a relative. But that didn't last, it, it wasn't sufficient for what I was needing and going through. And then a friend of mine was just finishing her time with Ava. So that's how Ava Gaim came So in talk picture. about provi so it was providential. Friend. She was just finishing up taking care of this other friend? Yes. And what, was, what happened to the other friend, Ava? She had um, hip replacement surgery. <laughs> so I took, I took care of her for three months. For three months, uh, yes, and, and you're just finishing up. Yes, when, when they talk in the phone. Right family. on time. Like, to the, literally the minute. To the minute. Man, God's been had his hand over you all this time. Big time. So you've, you got introduced, or she came over. Did you come over and meet her then? Yes. And, and it looked like it was going to be a good, uh, good relationship? Yes. So then did you move in at that point? We scheduled... A date where I would start taking start care taking of her. Start taking care of her, okay. And so I. Moved so were you in. home for a little while by yourself? No, I was never by never myself by because this this the other, other person um, brought in her a relative of hers just to be with me. So physically, you're having a hard time, but yeah. finally you're you're beginning to come, recover a little bit. Now, had they told you that the next step was going to be to go to Loma Linda? So. Then it began clicking on me, the Loma Linda, and the proton radiation for weeks. Um, and that's when the emotional part kicked in, and I plummeted. Because took a nosedive. Took a nosedive because... Emotionally. Emotionally, because I was battered down to nothing physically. I had lost 22 pounds because I couldn't eat. Um, and uh, because all the medication was making me ill, and I just thought, if one more thing is done with this body... It'll do me in. That's going to be it. There's nothing left. And so I was struggling with, it's my one chance to survive, and yet I'm not going to survive the therapy. I'm, I'm not even going to make it. I'm not going to make the... I cannot make it through 40 treatments. And going over to a place called Loma Linda. Loma Linda. Where is Loma Linda? All of that. And just more treatments and what's the use? That's where I was for a point. I did hit that what's the use point. If, 
you know, maybe the end's around the corner and all this for nothing. Ava can speak to this yeah. a little bit. So how was she, Ava? I mean... <clears throat> well, I would find her always, like, so depressed. She was in that state, and she'd constantly cry and tell me, what's the use of going to low, Melinda? And I, I always... More, always more beating on my body. Yeah, and I would always, like, tell her, you can't give up without giving a fight. So, yeah, you can't quit. No, yeah. You can't quit. You've got you to fight it. Yes, that's, that's what, what I always her. tell her. We don't and it was quit. falling on deaf we, ears for a while, wasn't we'll it? We'll do it together. She would do it together. Why? An angel. She's my angel. She's your angel. <laughs> Big time. So you finally relented. Yes. Is that a good word? Relent is the word. Relented the word to come over here. Yes, with Ava pushing. With Ava pushing the whole time. Yes. Still wondering why you're coming. So what happens when you get here? Well, when I get here, I go to the orientation meeting. I, I had some MRIs to do, but I could squeeze in one orientation meeting with you, and another friend brought me. And the friend listened to what you were saying, and she said, my God, you're walking into a caring community. And at that, she told you that. Yeah. And at that point, I didn't, I was so angry at her for putting a positive spin on. You're just trying to hype me up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that didn't hype me up. And then I went to the, because Ava pushed me to the Cordoma conference, and I was told by another woman, wait till you see how caring, wait till you see how loving. And I thought that was very nice of her. She's a nice She's lady. She's being nice and polite. And that's nice, you know, but... Be polite to sick patients. Well, she, she had been through the eight weeks. She had. So I knew she had... There, she, she was had, speaking from experience. She was then. speaking from experience, but she didn't know what a wreck I was. So how could she know that I'm... Yeah, you're different. I'm not going to... Much worse. Much, much worse. <laughs> yeah. That's I was, the way you're thinking of it. Yeah, sure. I was. Yeah, and, but, but she's still trying to put a positive spin on the I can't the believe thing. this is on camera, but that is the truth. Yeah. So what happened then? So then I came, and within a very short time, I knew that I was on a healing journey. Um, a, a, literally a journey of hope and a journey of healing. Now, Ava is a huge part of that, and I want to show you, this is, this is Ava. Ava reads my heart. Okay. And so she went to the gift shop, and she bought me this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, from Proverbs. And she, mind, body, spirit, she's been behind that every step of the way with the food I'm eating, with the spirituality, she sends me emails once or twice a day, with the spiritual world, she tells me, and with whipping me upside the head if I... <laughs> if you need it. If I need it. And I'm not joking about yeah, that. I understand. She can get a look. Yeah. And then I heard you say, you're more than your... you're more than your cancer, and that started to resonate because that those were the words that we used in the healing center. Really? We're more than our bodies. Mm -hmm. We're more than our disease. Right. We're more than we can possibly fathom. And it all started clicking into place. The, the text had such loving kindness. Dr. Laredo, my doctor, is so she's special. personable. She just she talks to you like a human, and she's engaging just like we are. Only she gets even closer. Does she? <laughs> she goes like this. Um, everybody, you walk in, and people are happy. And at first, that really angered me. Because they're sick. You're sick, and they're. And, and they're I happy. thought, why are they putting on all this? It's cute a front. Suit? Yeah, it's a front. But person after person was doing it. And then people greeted me. And slowly but surely, I realized that I had landed in a place of joy. 
a group of cancer patients and you landed, I landed in, a place, in a place of joy. And the ethos there is that when a new person comes in, we embrace them. Now, mostly they're men with prostate cancer, so it would be the wives right. embracing me. And um, it has just been remarkable. I am, I am healed on so many levels, I can't tell you. Healing takes place in many, many areas. Remember I talk about the treatments take place in the gantry or the fixed right. beam line. But healing is a process. And yes. you're going through that process. Yes. Now, Ava, what, what are your observations about her? Have you seen some changes taking place in her? Oh, definitely, you know. Before we came over, she was, I would say she was total wreck, you know, like <laughs> she would break down and cry every day. <laughs> really, you know, like yeah. it, it breaks my heart to see her that, you know, and I really, you know, I remember, it really makes me cry as well. It's all right. So I am so happy to see her now, you know, you know, she's laughing and I always tell her, She's Enjoy on a journey. Every day, you know, take and one a day at a time. And a journey of recovery yes. and a journey of healing. And so, really, I'm so happy. To see the change. To see the change in her, you know. It's taking place, isn't it? The it's, healing. The, it's happening. It's happening. Yeah. I, I and mean, it's I real. Can, and Yeah, and it's very real. Well, tell me about your interaction with the other patients. Well, it's, it's fascinating. I... I've never heard men speak so openly and honestly. And it's like we're, we're all human, we're all vulnerable, and there's such a level of humility. And openness, Deep and openness isn't there? Humility and openness. And the, the men have said to me, I mean, if I've had an occasion to, to say, tell me about, is this unique for you? Oh, absolutely. The, the I've experience never, that they're having. I have never been spoken to men like this in my life. And... That's all right. That's all right. In a, in, a, in a very... Well, what's going through my mind right now in a very profound way... Okay, let me just back up. So I've written some e emails to friends that were colleagues of mine in the Healing Center. And I said, you know what we talked and what we as individuals did? This whole clinic embodies that. They walk the mind, body, spirit, unity talk. It's absolutely pervasive. And humor, you always start things off with humor. And humor is a good part of the healing process. It is huge. And I mean, even I've seen you laugh. <laughs> and you weren't laughing when you first came. No, I was not laughing when I first came. <laughs> and but it's a part of the healing process. It is. Mary heart doeth good like medicine. That's one of the proverbs. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So the other patients, they've been making an impact on you. Yes. And you're making an impact on them. Well, a positive impact. Hopefully. Oh, well, you are. Well, we all are on each other. It's, we're in like a family, isn't it? Yes. I will say that I, I engage more with the wives than, than the men. Sure. Um, so I can say that the wives have just been absolutely, incredibly welcoming. And I was very fortunate that for one of my weeks here, there was another Cordoma patient. Christine, Christine, who was on your Canada. other, and that changed a lot for me. Well, it's like two, two twins that have been separated from life and you came exactly. together. Exactly. I know, it was really amazing to make that discovery. And many of the words you used about how I had been feeling, we said to each other, I finally f felt like I could say them sure, to the a same. kindred yeah. person and she said them to me. And then she was only here for a week, you know, in other words, her treatment was ending. But she, we, we really write each other every day. We text her email every single day. Still, still. Oh, absolutely. Right. And, and I forward all of email, 
Ava's uplifting emails. spiritual emails. And you're sending emails out to your friends too. I saw one of those the other day. Right. Keeping them informed about how things are going. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, we have people from around the world that are watching. And some people this week have just found out, they've heard those words, you have cancer. What would you tell them? Somebody just, they got sobering news, like you, they, they found out and they don't know all the implications of it, but they, they think of cancer in the big C. So what would you tell them? Just look into the camera and if you can think of what you'd tell them, not to give up. Well, I'll just say it from my heart. Sure. Lean in to God. Lean into God. And whatever that may mean to you, there is the essence that is there, and you can lean into it and trust it. Trust in the Lord. Second of all, it's a, it's a diagnosis. It isn't the total of your being. It isn't your who you are. I'm, I'm quoting Dr. Martell, but I, I know this to be absolutely true. However many more months or years I have, because there is not a cure for chordoma. This is giving me more time here but it's not the cure, because it isn't, it's not curable. That's not relevant. And this is what I've also every day from Ava. You got a caregiver. It's moment to moment. Live this moment, not the next moment. This moment, and this moment, and this moment. That's why the Lord says, today is the day of the Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And for our listening audience, you know, Judith is a wonderful example of somebody trusted in God. Look to him. He's got a plan for you in your life.